OK, this is a copy of Robert Hooke's Micrographia, which was published in 1665 um, under the auspices of the Royal Society of London. And it is a very important book in the history of science because here, for the first time ever, um, the reading public could see large pictures of tiny things that they'd never seen before. Uh, microscopes are a relatively new invention at this point. Um, not many people had looked through them, and the world was full of tiny things that we take for granted that we know what they look like. This, for instance, in front of me is a picture of a flea, and although it looks pretty horrid, we're not very surprised these days when we look at it and think, ah, that's a flea. Uh, Robert Hooke's contemporaries had never seen this kind of thing before. Um, what makes this remarkable is that this is a, a classic of science which shows you things that hadn't been seen before. We could make a comparison here with the other favorite book of the century, um, Isaac Newton's Principia, um, published a couple of decades later in 1687, that no one could understand. That is a book that only very, very few people could see what it was talking about at all. This, by contrast, is a book in English full of nice pictures that everyone can look at, and they can see immediately why it, what Hooke is talking about is important. So it's a book in which Hooke goes through all sorts of tiny objects, fleas, even uh, full stops made of printed ink, um, the points of needles, and he shows how the point of a needle is pitted and porous, not at all sharp, how we would think of it. Uh, and he, he shows the reading public of the time, at least the, the reading public that could afford such a beautiful book, that the tiniest objects in nature had a structure and a design all of their own. Um, so the important thing here is that he was showing people things they'd never seen before. Well, it's not just about tiny objects that are seen through the microscope. Hooke also talked about very large objects in this book, including the moon. He has a chapter on the surface of the moon. Why is the surface of the moon pitted? And so he uses telescopes as well. He also turns his microscope onto what we now call fossils. And he looks at them and he says, my microscope shows me that these look like they were once living things. And these things that look like they're made out of stone were once actually made out of organic matter. That's an extraordinary thought for the time, and it's something we might return to. So it's not just about microscopes. It's about microscopes and telescopes, and about, above all, how instruments can tell us things that we didn't know before. So the importance of this book in the history of science is that Hooke is making a big pitch for doing science with instruments. He says in the preface, for instance, very importantly, um, that before the fall of man, Adam could see like we can see through telescopes and microscopes, and that scientists who use instruments are in some senses getting back to the state of innocence. It's a very powerful claim for early science that what they're trying to do is reverse the effects of the fall. Well, I've said that one of the important things about this book is that Hook shows us uh, what he sees down his microscope, and incidentally the pictures will have been drawn by Hook, but maybe with a bit of help from his friend Christopher Wren as well. And that this is rather different from someone like Newton, who writes in difficult mathematics and Latin, a kind of text which is available only to the very few. Well, the corollary of all of that is that it's fun. It's a book that is fun to look at, and it amazed Hooke's contemporaries, and this is something that we, we shouldn't underestimate. Uh, science is not boring when it's seen in Hooke's micrographia. Samuel Pepys writes in his diary that he stayed up all night reading this magnificent book, and I think he wasn't reading it. He was looking at the pictures of everyday objects that crawl around on your head that you'd never seen in this kind of magnification before. So it's an important book scientifically because it shows you uh, what it's talking about, but it's important too because it is fun. Um, it gives the reader a sense of wonder rather than just asking him to trust some very difficult mathematics, for instance, that very few readers were competent of judging, whereas that is a flea, and, and we can feel in a kind of visceral uh, sense that this is a flea, and it's rather horrible to look at in its way. Well, why is this a library treasure? Uh, why is it important that this is in the Bodleian? Is it because it's valuable? Well, it is quite a valuable book, but there are many other more valuable books around. Um, is it because it's rare? Not particularly. Uh, you can buy a book of this if you're extremely uh, well healed now and then. Why is this particular book a treasure? Well, the reason why is in the shelf mark of this book. If we turn right to the front, we can see that on it is written Lister, Lister E7. So its shelf mark is Lister. Now, why is that important? Well, it tells me immediately that this book actually came from the library of one of Hook's friends, and indeed one of Hook's rivals, Martin Lister, who was a slightly younger contemporary of his, who was also a naturalist, who was also interested in fossils, 
Interestingly enough, Martin Lister disagreed strongly that fossils were actually the remains of once living things. He said that they were just tricks in stone, or at least most of them were. So the book was once owned by somebody who was intimately connected with Hook, um, who was one of Hook's rivals and who was one of his um, professional contemporaries in, in the early royal society. But it tells us a bit more than that. It's not just that the book was once owned by a friend of Hook's and so we can connect it right back to the author. But it shows us that it comes from the collection of books that was donated to a brand new institution at the time, which was the Ashmolean Museum, just across the road from the old Bodleian today, which opened its doors in 1683. That's an important thing because the Ashmolean was the first institution in Britain that combined the functions of a research laboratory with a teaching and lecturing, um, an educational institute. In other words, it's the forerunner of how we conceptualize science in the modern academe. It's a place where you both do original research and where you teach other people what to do. So it's an extremely institution, uh, important institutional precedent. And Lister, in order to kickstart this uh, Oxford um, research and teaching think tank, gave it a set of books that he thought it would need. And they were shelved in what's now the Museum of History of Science in shelving marked Lister. And in the 19th century, all of those books in the old Ashmolean um, were given to the Bodleian. So the shelf mark Lister here tells me a number of things. It tells me that the book ultimately comes from one of Hooke's contemporaries, but it also tells me that it's part of the first institutional library connected to what we can recognize as a, as a, a kind of modern scientific uh, institution. And it reminds us finally that what happens ultimately to these institutions is that they get swallowed by bigger institutions. Uh, and in time, the Bodleian came to inherit on trust all of the Ashmolean's books. And so ultimately it's a treasure because it reminds us that the Bodleian isn't just a library full of books, but it's a library full of libraries full of books, and that it has an important uh, role as a custodian of earlier institutions. So this is a treasure because it reminds us something about the institutional responsibility and in history um, of the Bodleian, as well as telling us something about early science.